Hey, hey. Welcome back to the middle school room. Glad you're here. We're in a different spot now. I don't know if you've noticed, but the last, like, every video, I try to go to a different spot in the room or a different spot in my house to do it. So we're in a different spot now. Pretty fun. Interesting. Someone asked me if I cut these things on Wednesday. I did not. That'd be cool. I'd be like a lumberjack. <laughs> Anyways, welcome back. I'm glad you're here. I haven't been, like, etching the number in the wall or anything like that, but I've been keeping track of how many days it's been since I've seen most of you. You guys want to take a guess at how many days it's been? 80 days. Today's Monday, so you're watching on Sunday though, but on Monday, it has been 80 days since the last time I've seen most of you. For those of you who are here on Wednesday, that number's different, obviously, and I'm really glad you came. It was good to see you. It was great just to spend time with you. If you didn't make it Wednesday, no pressure, no big deal. I'm not there to shame you. I'm not there to say, like, you should have been here. That's not how I feel at all. But I'm looking forward to making that day reset back to zero. <laughs> I miss you guys. Just want you to know that you are missed by me, Nicole, the leaders. We all miss you. We want to get time with you. You're loved by all of us. God loves you, obviously. We talk about that a lot. But we love you, too, and we miss you, and we can't wait to see you again. If you can make it out on a Wednesday... That'd be awesome, and we want to see you there. And if you can't make it out on a Wednesday, it's no problem. We'll see you when we get to see you, and that'll be a good thing too. Let me give you a couple announcements for what's coming up in uh, this month and maybe a little bit in July, and then we'll talk about our topic for today. Also, I'm in a new spot, so I've got all my notes right in front of me, so don't mind me if I'm looking down. It's not because I'm ignoring you. There's just a lot to cover today. So, All right, announcements. The first one is I'll keep repeating that Discord. The link is in the description of the video below. You just plug your, uh, or you click that link, plug your real name in there and sign up. We play games live and over Discord on Wednesday nights from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. You jump in there, play some Jackbox games with us. It's a really fun time. I can teach you how to do all of it. All you got to do is just sign up on Discord and I'll hook you up with it. You just, you just type in Discord and you get there to say, hey, Miles, it's me. <laughs> I need help and I'll help you out and you'll be good to go, okay? So with that, Wednesday nights, we'll be here at the church, 6.30 to 8 p.m., right in the middle school room. We're going to do jackpot games with those who are at home and can't meet with us so that we can play games together. But you can also come here and not play jackbox and do other things. So if you want to play a board game, if you want to chat with some friends in the corner, if you want to catch up with your small group leader, any of those things, come on out, 6.30 to 8 o'clock, Wednesday night, right in the middle school room. We'll be here every week through the summer. There's certain events happening through the summer that will change the times and what we're doing. I'll let you know when we get to those. But otherwise, every single Wednesday, we'll be right here hanging out together. And like I said before, I've said it probably three times in this video already, is if you can't make it, it's, not, it's no problem. We're not upset with you. We don't think down of you. We don't think lower of you. You're not like in the uncool club if you don't come. That's not it in any way. The, way for, the, way, the reason why we have this building open is because we're able to now but we know that not every family is able to come out and be together. And so we want to accommodate you at home and you who can come together. And that's why we do Jackbox on those Wednesday nights. So we'll see you there or we won't, and we'll at least hear from you on Wednesday night, 6.30 to 8 o'clock. The next thing is that I know you guys have been dying to go to the Nerf War. It got postponed in April, and now it's been scheduled July 8th right here at the church from 8 to 10 p.m. I'll fill you in all the details for what we're doing that night when you get there but all you got to do is bring a nerf gun with a nerf blaster that's what i'm calling them now they're not guns they're blasters because nerf is cool we're <laughs> bring your nerf blasters out i've got 600 glow in the dark darts for you to use and i found a whole tub of darts back in a corner somewhere that i don't know there's gotta be a thousand darts in there there's gonna be plenty so you don't have to bring your darts with you if you do that's fine but you may not get all of them back understand that they're gonna be all over the building that night so i don't really want to find your 10 specific darts to take home. So just don't bring your darts. We'll use ours. <laughs> uh, you want to bring blasters that can fire standard size nerf darts. So don't bring the ones that shoot the like ping pong balls or the discs or any of that. We don't got any of those. So just bring the standard size nerf blaster shooter thing. 8 to 10 p.m. July 8th. Uh, the other thing that we got coming up to is June 24th, a Wednesday night from 8 to 10 p.m. We'll be out at the bowl at the church in the fire pit. Not in the fire pit. That would be really hot and dangerous. We're going to be at the fire pit, around a fire, doing some s'mores. We're going to do some worship music. We'll have some field games in the lawn there. Come on out. We'll also be at the high schoolers. The high schoolers are going to hang out with us on that night from 8 to 10 p.m. We'll all hang out together and do stuff. It'll be a really fun time. Um, and you don't have to bring anything except if you want to cook anything besides s'mores. So if you want to cook a hot dog over the fire, you got to bring a hot dog. Um, and I'll, I don't have condiments or anything like that. So you got to bring all the fixings for it. Uh, if you want to cook a... 
I was going to say a stuffed animal, but we don't want to cook those either. Something edible <laughs> over the fire. You can bring it with you and we can cook it there. Um, but I don't have anything for the extras, just more stuff. But no cost, no nothing like that. June 24th, 8 to 10 p.m., out at the fire pit. Hope to see you there. Uh, this July, from July 6th to July 9th, we are going to team up with Becky Terrell and the Kids Quest crew to do backyard bobble clubs in the area around us. Like So there's going to be families who are going to sign up to host their backyard and get a bunch of neighborhood elementary school kids together to do sort of what Becky does on Wednesday nights in their backyard. So we're going to bring church to them. And the middle school team, the, whoever wants to join in on it, gets to help run those nights. Or they're not even nights, they're afternoons. So if you want to be a part of that, uh, here's one quick detail of it. We're going to go over everything when we meet together in a, in a couple weeks. But we're going to meet, or we're going to do Back Your Bible Club from July 6th to July 9th. It's going to be the same exact thing every time each day, but it's at different homes in different backyards. And we're in charge of doing a worship song or two, as well as like leading a game. And then we get to spend time with all the students and set them up for the story and the craft and everything like that. The Backyard Bible Club itself lasts around an hour to an hour and a half, but there's also like transportation and getting together and all that. So it'll end up being like two or three hours for you that day. And there's potential that there's two in one day. So we might go from like 10 to 1130, then come back here, have lunch, then go back out at one and go until 2.30 and then go home. Stuff like that. I, I'll get the details as soon as people sign up uh, for the neighborhoods. But if you want to be a part of this, you need to talk to me by tomorrow, Monday. So I don't, I don't have the date in front of me because you're watching this on Sunday. Tomorrow, Monday, I need to know that you're coming so that I can get you information. And it doesn't cost anything. There's no fee. You just sign up and let me know that you're coming. And I'll send all the information out to your family. We're going to meet once or twice the week or two before July 6th or 9th, 6th through 9th, so that we can meet and talk about and practice the music that we're going to do, the game we're going to lead, and get you all the dates and information for how transportation all that's going to work. I just need to know you're coming. So if you've already told me that you're coming, just assume that you haven't told me and retell me. I, I have the list of people who have told me, but just to verify if I missed anybody, I need you to type it in live chat. Leave it in a comment on the YouTube video or have your family send me an email or phone call me that says they want to come on the trip. So it's just going to be around here, but I'll, we'll figure all the details when we get there. If you want to be a part of it, you got to let me know so I can send the information out for you. Okay? Cool. Awesome. And the last thing is that there's a whole bunch of stuff happening this summer. We have events like more than we've ever had in the summer because I haven't seen you guys for 80 days. And so we've got a whole lot of plans so that you guys can come back here and hang out whenever you get a chance to. So keep your ears open for all the stuff that's happening in July and August. And then September is around and school is back. Oh, I'm sorry. I said school. I'm sorry. My bad. <laughs> but when school comes back around, hopefully we'll be back in the building doing everything like we normally do. So I'll let you know more details as we get closer. All right. So last week we started a series about being a superhero. If you didn't watch my, my video from last week, that's okay. Finish this one out, then go back to last week's video and watch what we uh, talked about last week on our superpowers. Let me give you a quick refresher, though, for those who did see it, just to remind you. We talked about how, as Christians, people who follow Jesus, we have super abilities that non-Christians don't have. Right. So if you're watching this video and you're not a Christian, these videos are going to be just good information for you. But they're not necessarily true for you because you're not a Christian. You don't, you're not following Jesus. If you are following Jesus... You have these superpowers as a Christian. And the last week we talked about how we have super understanding. That according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we have the mind of Christ. Which means that we see things, we understand things differently than a non-Christian does. Because we see them through God's eyes. Right? When, when things happen, whether good or bad, we have a different perspective on why those things happen. Because we see things through God's eyes. And we have an eternal perspective in mind. Right? That the things that happen now in my day aren't that big of an instance in comparison to the timeline of eternity. <laughs> that God has a big plan for eternity. And, and he cares about our day-to-day -day as well and what happens. But when we look at things, the like example we brought up last week was like when we look at the COVID time or the protests that are happening in our country, we know that those things aren't good and God has a plan for all of it. Whereas someone who doesn't follow Jesus, there is no person who has a plan for all of this. It's just really bad times, right? And there's lots of other things for why or how Christians understand things differently than non-Christians do. We also talked about last week about how uh, in order to develop our superpowers, we need to look at our spiritual diet to see if we're spiritual babies or spiritually mature. 
And we also talked about how we need to look at our spiritual workout to see if we're working out our spiritual muscles, right? How are we getting to develop that mind of Christ? Uh, and so you can look at my video for that last week. It's in the description of this video. Just watch that later, and you can see uh, the answers to all those questions in there. Uh, it, like I say every time, I thought it was a great video, So, but I taught it, so it has to be good, right? <laughs> I'm not trying to be conceited in that way. It's just I can't have another perspective. If I, if I put a video up and I was like, that was bad, but I still put it up, that would be dumb. I'd just have to remake the video. So I feel like it went well, so you should go check it out. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Um, before we move on, I want to ask this question in for those who are watching in live chat. I want you to answer this question to everybody there and ask the people or talk to the people in your family about it. You got 30 seconds, just real quick. But did any of you who watched the video last week do any spiritual workouts this week? And what did you do? What was something that you did that was either different or more intense or whatever else than, than you've normally done to work out your spiritual muscles? Type that in the live chat or tell the people around you. Ready, set, go. Don't mind me. My keys are going to jingle if I don't take them off. <laughs> All right. Come on back. Uh, you can continue that discussion another time, too. I hope you got a little bit of a workout in last week. Remember that regular workouts are what's really going to build those muscles up. So if you're not doing something now, start something. And if you are doing something, how can you make it more um, worthwhile? Is that the right word? More intense. More More bigger. <laughs> I can make it better. Whatever that looks like, set a goal for yourself and work that out regularly. Now, we ended last week talking about how uh, I was going to add more to last week's video, but I was like, I think that's enough for now. So the start of this video is actually the end of last video. So let me let me fill you in on what we're doing. The end of the last week's video, we talked about how you can see your spiritual muscles grow with one way of like keeping a journal. If you kept a journal of your time in the Word and what your prayer requests are, and you did that for a month, um, like regularly. So say you read every day or every other day for a month and recorded your thoughts and the verses that you read and your prayer requests and just things that are on your mind while you're reading scripture. You could see how you grew spiritually from the first of the month to the end of the month by rereading that journal. And I know there's some people who are like, that is a really great idea, Miles. Thank you so much. And other of you are like, journals are dumb and I'm never going to do that. That's cool. No problem. It was just one idea. I want to start this video to give you some fresh ways to get in scripture that isn't journal writing, right? So here's some more ideas for how you can do some spiritual workouts that keep scripture fresh whenever you open it. So here we go. First one, instead of just like opening a random page in scripture and reading whatever that page is, instead take time to read and then reread and then maybe reread and then maybe reread again and then maybe one more time the same book over and over and over. Not necessarily in one sitting, just like say for the month of July, you're going to read Philippians, and you're only going to read Philippians for the whole month of July. You're not going to jump to another book. You're not going to go somewhere else. You read through whatever your, your routine is for uh, Bible study through Philippians, and when you get to the end of the Philippians, you start back over Philippians 1 and do it again, right? That might give you a fresh way to say, well, I want to do this not because it's repetitive, but because it may give me a, a better understanding of what God's heart was when he had Philippians 4 recorded and put in the Bible. Why is Philippians there? Well, let's read through it a bunch and see if we can see the themes that God is pointing out through Paul in Philippians for us to know today. There's one idea. Another one. If you read one chapter from Proverbs and five chapters from Psalms every night before bed for a month, you will have read through all of the book of Proverbs because there's 31 chapters in Proverbs, and you will have read through all of the chapters in Psalms because there's 150 chapters in Psalms in one month. And while you do that, not only will you conquer these really awesome big books, but you'll also gain a little wisdom along the way. Proverbs is a book full of wisdom. Um, it's awesome. And Psalms just has a whole bunch of like lyrical feeling poetry. I know that sounds weird, but it's not historical. It's like music without the music. It's the lyrics to music all up in there and poems and stuff like that. So you'll gain some wisdom about how people thought and, and feel when you do that. So maybe try that out. That could be your routine for July is I'm going to read one chapter from Proverbs and five chapters from Psalms every day for the whole month of July. Could be cool. I actually know a family who does that every month in addition to whatever they do. Their family devo for the day is as a family, they read through one proverb and five Psalms every day, every, every month of the year. So they've probably gone through those books a whole bunch, I imagine. All right, another one. You could commit to read through the entire New Testament in 12 months, in one year. So you could start this week and in 52 weeks, you, you could 
space it out so you could read the whole New Testament in one year, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, the math behind that, I took this from somebody else. I didn't actually do it myself. They said an average reader can get through the whole New Testament in one year if they read every day for five minutes a day. If they just read five minutes from the Bible every day from the New Testament, they'll finish Matthew through Revelation in one year. That's pretty cool. Five minutes? That's like nothing. Like, that's how long it takes me to brush my teeth. Like, I can't do that reading scripture? That's pretty good. Okay, another one. This is one that my wife really likes. Um, I, I really need to try this sometime. I haven't done it before, but my wife loves it. Maybe you guys would too, is read through chapter, a uh, chapter or more, whatever your routine is in scripture each day, but have a notebook and a pencil nearby for art. So after you get done reading, draw a picture or, or paint. My wife likes to watercolor, so maybe you would paint Paint a picture of something that God is telling you through that scripture in that notebook once per day that you read. Then you've got a whole journal of art, of scriptural art pieces, as well as what you read it from, from scripture, which is so cool. I love that idea. Like having an art book of what, what pictures God gave you while you were reading, like in like you have it now down. It's not just in your head floating around. Like you made it. That's awesome. I think that's a great idea. So, and it, like my wife's doing sketchbook videos where she like, she takes a video of every page in her sketchbook for people to look at what she uh, comes up with. That'd be a really cool video idea when you finish a month to go through and say, well, here's my 30 days of sketching that I did off of scripture. That would be so cool to see. I would love to see somebody's sketchbook of that. So. so there's four ideas of ways to keep scripture fresh and to work out your spiritual muscles when you're doing uh, your, your devos for the day or for the week or whatever that is. So, um, so hey, if you're feeling bold right now, no pre you don't have to do this. This is just a, a quick challenge. If you're feeling bold, type in live chat now and confirm with the people around you what's a way that you want to keep Scripture spirit, uh, fresh to grow your spiritual muscles this week. What's, what's one of these ideas of the four here and the one from last week, the journal, that you would love to try? And you're going to do it. This week, you're going to do your devos this way and see what it's like. Who, who wants to type that in chat and say, I'm going to do this? Right? Type that out now. And future Miles, Sunday Miles, who's watching this, will read through those and affirm what you're doing. Uh, but I hope you take time to think through, like, what's something I really want to try? And then what are you going to do? Don't just hear them and say, that's a cool idea. Like, do them. That would be awesome. And I'd love to, to be a part of that with you. If you want some ideas or some help or some buddy along that, that'd be fun. Okay, this week, we're going to take a look at another superpower that we have. Um, but it's not quite a superpower like what you're thinking, right? When we think of superpowers, we think of, like, abilities that make people different than regular people like cyclops can shoot rays out of his eyes or like iron man well he's just really he's just really smart he doesn't actually have superpowers right he has a suit but that he made right but then you look at like oh who else do we have who's the guy from the incredibles the 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 big guy from incredibles mr incredible duh i should have known that mr incredible like he's super strong he can pick up like huge things that's a superpower the superpower we're talking about this week is more like a think of it like a training facility to work on your other superpowers or like a super suit that's kind of one thing i like to say like because i love iron man so iron man's nothing without a suit he's just a really smart guy with lots of money right batman's the same way batman has no superpowers but he has a really sweet like tons of gadgets and lots of money to make the things that he wants to to be a superhero and, uh, and they're fit i mean that's a big thing too they they can run forever kind of thing right but they, they wouldn't be anything without those suits. And we are going to talk about our spiritual uh, or our, our super uh, powers today that are kind of like our super suit in that way. Right? You know, you know that quote, the really famous quote from uh, The Incredibles, Frozone. Where is my super suit? Right? And Iron Man, like I've said, he needs his super suit or he can't do anything. Like he's just, he's just a smart guy. We've seen... Like in the, in the movies, when he doesn't have a suit, he runs to go find a suit. That's all he can do, right? We need our suit, though, in order to, to be a superpower or a superhero in some ways because it helps, it helps people identify who we are, right? If Spider-Man didn't wear his iconic red and blue uh, suit, like no one, he'd just be Peter Parker walking around New York, New Jer the Bronx. Where is he from? Queens? It's somewhere in New York. He'd just be a kid from New York. But when he wears the suit... Right? He always has the powers whether he's wearing the suit or not, but the suit helps people identify that Spider-Man and he's a good guy. Right? And I just think this is funny to think about because super suits help us identify who we are or what we do, but we also have the other side of superheroes, right? So superheroes, they do all the really great things and they, they get really cool, brassy, awesome music when they fly in from somewhere. And like people applaud them when they do good things. 
but they're always fighting against somebody, right? They're fighting against super villains, right? They're, the people they fight against aren't just like average Joes who are mean. Like, they're, <laughs> what's the difference between a super villain and a superhero? They all have abilities, right? They all do really crazy, like, super things, but they do things for different reasons, right? Like, look at these classic uh, super villains, right? So here's my first one. You guys might not know this guy, but this is Magneto, right? He's from the X-Men series. He, like, he can control metal. That's his superpower. Like, he, he can telepathically tell metal to do things, like fly around or move it around, all that stuff. Like, he's, if he weren't an evil person, he'd be a superhero, right? What, what makes him a supervillain? Like, he's got superpowers, right? How about this guy? This is a good, a good Marvel one. This is Loki, right? Like, Loki, and Loki's maybe on the edge because sometimes he's a hero and sometimes he's a villain. But more, more often than not, he's a villain. Like, he caused the first Avengers movie to happen, which is a great movie, by the way. Thank you, Loki, for doing that. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but, like, Loki's a supervillain. Like, but he's got superpowers. He's, like, mischievous, and he can, like, transform the way he looks, and he can, like, take their voice on and everything, and he can fuse people. He can, like, warp things around and stuff like that. Like, Loki's, if Loki weren't evil, or if he had bad, if he didn't have bad intentions, he'd be a superhero, right? And we see that in Marvel. So, there's sometimes where he sides with his brother, Thor, and they do great things together as superheroes. And then other times, Loki, you know, he goes to the dark side and he decides to make bad choices. And then he's a supervillain. But they got the same, same aptitude. They have the same powers. Not like they don't have the same powers, but they all have superpowers. So why are they so different? How about this guy? There's an old one. Bane. Man, Bane from Batman. This guy was like an internet sensation when the movie was released, right? And like Bane's just basically a really strong guy with a really freaky mask, right? But he's like, he's a super person right but he's a villain he's a super villain in the series he's not a superhero right and it's not because their suits look different that makes them a super villain it's not that all the evil guys wear black and red and that's what makes them evil because like spider-man wears red but he's a superhero what's the difference between a superhero and a super villain right well super villains they they grow fruit right so our, i didn't tell you what our superpower is our superpower today is super fruit super fruit Right? Galatians chapter 5 talks about the, spru the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We looked at it in chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. And it talks about how people who are following Jesus, they have this fruit growing in their lives, and it lets people identify who they are based on that fruit. But supervillains, they also grow fruit, but their fruit is rotten. It's terrible. It's evil. It's bad. Right? Their fruit, here we go. The opposite of the fruits of the Spirit are these. Hate, despair, worry, agitation, meanness, wickedness, unfaithfulness, violence, unrestraint, and I'm sure there's plenty more, right? Where they're doing the opposite of what the fruit of the Spirit is. It's, it's all about their fruit. They may have really a, amazing abilities, but they're going for the wrong thing. They're going for evil things instead of good things, and that's what makes them a supervillain instead of a superhero, right? It's sort of like this verse in Matthew chapter 7, and remember last week I, I put those sheets up, and they're kind of hard to read, so this week, this week I got them bigger. Here we go got my friendly whiteboard out here. See if you can see that. There we go. Here we go. Here's Matthew 7. Yeah, you can see that. Good. Matthew 7, verses 16 through 18 says this. You can identify them by their fruit. That is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes? The answer is obvious. No. Or can you pick figs from thistles? The answer is obvious. No. A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces, you know it, bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit, right? Now, these are fruits that are native to Jesus' time, right? In Jerusalem, they'd be picking, like, figs and grapes. That's their thing, right? Around here, you might say, can an apple tree produce an orange? No, that'd be really cool, though. <laughs> like a fruit, a fruit basket tree, that'd be pretty sweet. Apples make apple trees. Can orange trees make watermelons? No. <laughs> orange trees grow oranges. They don't grow watermelons, right? If you want to grow a pumpkin... You need pumpkin seeds that grow pumpkins. They, pumpkin seeds don't grow gourds. They, they grow pumpkins, right? That's what they do. It's the same thing with fruit. And this verse is saying that you can identify people by the fruit that they grow, right? So when we talk about super fruit, the fruits of the Spirit, the character qualities that are in superheroes, no, it's not superheroes, in super Christians, I guess, <laughs> in our superpowers, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Right? We can look at the fruit in their lives, their character qualities, and say, oh, that person must be a Jesus follower because they're growing the fruit of the Spirit in their life. Right? Where the opposite end, the supervillains, they grow the fruit of hate, despair, worry, agitation, meanness, wickedness, unfaithfulness, violence, unrestraint, and more. 
right? And you can identify that that supervillain, they, they have abilities, but their abilities are for bad, right? And they're not doing it for the right reasons. And, and it, it, the fruit that grow from them are different than the fruit that grow from superheroes. Does that make sense? Right? Matthew 7 says that, that well. So we can identify people by their fruit. And I know some of you are thinking like, well, I don't literally have a fruit hanging off my arm. Otherwise, I need to get that checked out. That's If you have literal fruit hanging from your arm, you need to go to the doctor right now. Just pause this video and get out of here. <laughs> right? It's not talking about literal fruit. It's talking about character qualities. Right? And this verse says it really well. You can identify them by the fruit. That is by the way they act. That's what I underlined up there. By the way they act. What are their actions that they do that you know show what their fruit are? There's another thing here too, right? It helps us see what's inside. It's actually, it's on the flip side of my board here. Let me, can I do this? Nope, hold up. Here we go. Look at that. I was prepared for you guys. I wrote two verses on here. This one will be bigger, but here we go. So here's, this will let us show, or let us see too, like how do we know what fruit is in us? Like what do we know? How do we know what fruit's growing in us? Because it's not literally hanging off my arm. How do I know what fruit's there? It says this. A tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. You brood of snakes, not you guys. It's, this is Jesus talking about the Pharisees. You brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in, you, in your heart determines what you say. Let me repeat that because that's like the key part of this passage. For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And a bad person produces evil things, or an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of evil things in their heart. And by treasury, it means like, what are the things stored up in their heart? What are they stored in their heart? Is it good things? Then they're going to say good things. If there's evil things in their heart, they're going to say evil things, right? This verse is so good to let us to help us identify what fruit is growing in us because of this underlined part of the passage. For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. If you want to know what fruit is growing in your life, Look at the words you say, right? Also, from that verse from the other side, look at how you act. You can determine what fruit is growing in your life, what character qualities you have by the words you say to other people and the acts that you do, whether people are watching or not. The things you do, actually, I don't remember who said the quote, but the things you do when no one's watching determines your character, which is a hard one because other people can't tell you what that is because they only see you when they see you. They can't see you when... They don't see you. <laughs> that makes sense, right? The things you do in secret determine what your character qualities are. And so if you want to be, if you want to see if you have good fruit in your life, you need to take a self-examination moment to say, well, what do I say and how do I act? Right? And if you don't know, if you can't pinpoint that, maybe you need to talk to somebody first, right? Your parents or guardians are a really great resource for that. I know that's kind of an awkward conversation to be like, hey, can you tell me all the really good and bad things that I do? But I, I tell you what. If you come to your parent or guardian and say, I want to know if I'm growing fruit of the spirit or fruit of evil in my life, can you tell me like the good things and the bad things that I do? They'll, they'll tell you. They want to help you. That's a good thing, right? Ask people that know you well to identify some of those. Sometimes they can be a good help when we blind ourselves to you know, how we actually think we are in that way. So there's my first challenge in that is that if you want to be a superhero, you need to have super fruit in your life that are good fruit. And I know supervillains, though, they, they look so cool. Like, supervillains have some of the greatest outfits and craziest powers, and they're, like, they're, they're nuts, right? Like, they're, like, Darth Vader, he's awesome. I'm just saying. He's not an awesome person, though. He's not an awesome person. He's really well done in the movies. But if any of you guys were Darth Vader in this classroom, I would, you wouldn't be able to be here. <laughs> I can't have lightsabers taking people out in the middle school room, okay? You understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that... You shouldn't like the outfit that the villains wear. That's not it at all. It's saying don't try and be a supervillain. Don't aspire to be a supervillain, right? Okay, you give, I don't have to talk anymore about that. That's just obvious. <laughs> okay. okay, hey, I want you all to take one second because the, the next question is like, well, how do I know like what I fill my life with then? Like if I want, oh, I didn't get to that point yet. Dude, I got to make my point. It's what, what's in us. So what do, <laughs> if what's in us determines what comes out of us, then we need to fill our life with things that are good to grow good fruit and not fill our lives with rotten things to grow rotten fruit, right? So the ex what I'm getting at is like the things you read, the things you watch, the things you talk about, the things you wear, the things you think is the best, and the things you think are the worst, 
all the ways that you think, and this would be the word that encapsulates all of this is worldview. What's your worldview, right? How do you live your life based on the way that you think things should be or are, right? And that determines what you fill your life with, what you put into you, is what's going to come out of you, right? That's what the end of this verse is saying, that whatever is good or bad in their heart is going to come out, right? So you have to fill your things with good things in order to have good things come out of you. You need to fill your things with bad things if you want bad things coming out of you, which nobody nobody wants that, right? What goes in comes out, <laughs> right? So if you want a spiritual flush, I tried coming up with something more tactful than that, but that's the best thing I got. So understand, when I say flush, it's not necessarily a bathroom reference, but y'all went there, so I'm just going to bring it to light right now. It's not about it's not about spiritual bathrooms. That's not it at all. <laughs> if you want to flush out your spiritual system, and get rid of all the bad things that are in your life or the rotten fruit, you need to start filling your life with good fruit. And so that's where I wanted to ask this question. Everyone in, in who's watching the video right now, you can leave a comment or a, a YouTube live chat um, thing. You can type it on there. Write out what's one good thing that people can fill their life with that will grow good fruit. You got five seconds. <laughs> You'll see a whole bunch of these pop up, and I'll, I'll give you my answer in just a second. But what are the things that you can fill your life with that will grow good fruit? In your life. Ready, set, go. Okay. That's plenty of time. And if you didn't get it in, just, just type it anyways and throw it in there. People can read it. Here's my answer. Maybe it's obvious. Maybe it's not. But if you're not filling your life with scripture, then, like, that's a really good thing. Scripture's awesome. Take time reading scripture. Take time talking to people about scripture. Take time asking questions of scripture. Take time telling other people about scripture, like teaching them scripture. Those are all good things that are going to grow good fruit. And so when you do those things, it fills your life with good things, and, and those things are going to come out of you as well and overflow to other people. All right? Cool. There's that. Here's the last thing, because the last question without all is like, well, how do I then grow these spiritual gifts? Like I'm filling myself with them, and the fruit are supposed to grow, but how do I know if the fruit are growing? Like how do I see progress, right? That was the last question from before. How do I see the mind of Christ growing in my life? How do I develop spiritual muscles? In the same way, how do I develop the spiritual fruit that are supposed to be in my life, right? And I found, like, I could tell you forever, but I found two devos. I don't think this is a coincidence at all. I was reading through scripture about the fruit of the Spirit a long time ago and recently, and these two things came up on my devo app, and I thought they were perfect. So I thought that I'd just read them for you because you'd like someone else's perspective instead of my own, because I'm kind of crazy sometimes, so I get it. Like, let's get someone else's face in there, or words, not face. I'm going to read it still, but someone else's words, okay? So here's here's two quick things from a devo that I read, and I have to read them, so please don't mind me looking down. Here we go. So I was reading a devotional quite a few months ago and loved what it was saying about the fruit of the Spirit so much that I screenshot it on my phone and, and emailed it to myself, right? And I wanted to read what that devo said about what it means about producing spiritual fruit. And this is from many months ago. I mean, like almost a year ago, I read this and it, I didn't save it because of this talk. I saved it because it was so good. Like I wanted to remember it all the time. <laughs> so I screenshot it. It's in my, my email. I'll show it to you sometime if you want to see it. But here's what that thing had to say. So at the beginning of this devotional it talks about how um, the writer of this devotional's young son was watering plants outside their home. And the writer took note of how this young son went to each of the plants to make sure that the strawberries that they were starting to grow would continue to grow and, and be, you know, really good strawberries to pick off your plant. So this is what the, the author said. When I was watching him water the plants, he was carefully watering each individual strawberry instead of the soil and the plant itself. I may not have a green thumb, but I do know that water, that the water needs to come up through the roots. Maybe if I learned more about agriculture, I would understand more about how God works uh, how God works in and through our hearts because the Bible is full of farming metaphors. I don't know if you realize that or not. This is a side note. Go through a lot of the parables Jesus taught. It's like a lot of farming references. And this is another one. The fruit of the Spirit, obviously, is farming. So this goes in. Okay. Full of farming metaphors. And that is where we find ourselves today in probably the most recognizable passage of Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit. When it comes to our Christian faith, like my son, we become so focused on the fruit we will ourselves to be more patient with our children, or we somehow think that if we just try harder, we will become more peaceful or joyful. But Paul is saying that think that thinking is basically like looking at a big lemon tree and watering the actual lemon on the tree. The fruit is simply a byproduct of a healthy plant. We are simply the branch connected to the vine 
being cared for by the gardener. All the branch has to do to produce fruit is stay connected. Right? You get the picture that they're saying, right? Isn't that goofy? Like, can you imagine if your family told you to go outside and water the garden and you're growing apples in the tree and you get a ladder and fill your water bucket and water each individual apple on the tree? That is ridiculous. Like, no one does that. That's not how plants work, right? If you want to grow apples on an apple tree, you need to water the tree, which is the roots on the ground. You need to water the ground around the tree so that the water gets absorbed into the roots and goes to all the branches in the tree to grow the apples, right? Sometimes in our Christian walk with our spiritual fruit, we like to think that if we don't put all of our energy and focus into growing one of those fruits, so they use patience as the example, or say it's joy, we want to be more joyful. So that means I need to practice being joyful as much as possible. I mean, that's, that's well and good. You should practice that. But that's like watering the one joyful fruit on your tree. It's not watering the whole plant. If you want to be more joyful... You need to be connected to Jesus. <laughs> you need to be connected to the vine, like right? capital V vine. Jesus is the true vine. That's John 15, right? 15, I think that's right. Uh, he is the true vine. If you want to grow fruit, you need to stay on the vine. And so if you're worried about your like the spiritual fruit not growing, take a look at your walk with Jesus first. Don't look at the individual fruits. The fruits will grow as a byproduct, right? As a it's, it's enough cause and effect. If you spend time and grow with Jesus, those fruit are going to grow in your life too. That's part of, it all goes together. It's like a big system. Does that make sense? So if you're looking at those spiritual fruit and you're like, well, man, I feel like I'm pretty loving, but I don't have any joy. Don't look at the joy part. I mean, that's, you can, but look at your, your walk with Jesus, right? What's your spiritual walk look like? What are you missing, right? If you're not growing joy, but you're growing love, Joy is part of growth in Jesus. It's not just one of the fruit or a couple of the fruit. It's all of those fruit. So you need to look at your relationship with Jesus and fix that. Stay connected to the vine, right? Okay, cool. That's number one. Second one. I know that all that I just said is really, it sounds really easy, right? Like, just stay with Jesus. You're going to be fine. And yet we still get ourselves in a rut where we're like, well, I don't know how to do that. Like, how do I stay connected to Jesus, right? It's really hard when you can't literally, like, hang yourself up on a vine physically, like, I don't literally walk to a vine down the street and be like, oh, I'm with Jesus today, and I hook on. It's like, it's all, I know it's like invisible and spiritual, and it, th these are metaphors. They're not literally, they're not literal vines. You know that, but then it's hard to test to be like, well, how do I know if I'm connected to the vine? How do I know if I'm growing spiritual fruits? That's why I'm telling you all these things, right, is to help you out with that. So here's, here's another thing that will help you understand, like, the vine thing, right? I thought this was so good. It helps us understand like when we want to stay connected to the vine it means this and here's another farming metaphor to go with it so here we go the references that he uses in this passage is john 15 about the true vine uh, i'm not going to read all of john 15 because it's pretty long so you can go read john 15 after this video and then just pull this video back up to this part and reread what i'm listening to if you want to but if you know the true vine thing in john 15 this will this will definitely make sense it'll still make sense if you haven't read it okay here we go this devotional might not immediately suggest the exercise of surrender to you. It may not, it may not be telling you that you need to surrender, but it, it is, right? Because branches don't naturally choose their vine, right? If Okay, and I got to stop there. When you go out to a, a pumpkin patch, right, or a watermelon patch, whatever, all those plants grow on a vine. And the watermelon didn't wake up one day and go like, oh, I want to go to that vine today. And they like roll across the field and connect to a vine. That would be so cool to watch. That is not how life actually works, right? The plant, the, the fruit just grows on the vine and it stays there, right? So it, it's weird that Jesus uses a metaphor to say that you have to remain on the vine, like like we have a choice. But we do, and that's what this author is saying, is that it's a metaphor, all of it doesn't fit perfectly, but we do have a choice in connect to the vine. And yet, in Jesus' story, there appears to be some choice. Otherwise, he wouldn't need to counsel the disciples to remain in me. The words he uses is remain in me. And he doesn't stop there. Jesus continues by laying out the ramifications of both choices. Jesus explains what happens if they, or if we, choose to abide in him, then we'll bear much fruit, and he will provide for our requests. He also clarifies that if they, or if we, choose not to abide in him, we'll be discarded and we'll shrivel up and be burned. Strong words. I know that's a little blunt, but that's, that's, what, he's, that's what Jesus says in that whole thing. If you're not going to produce fruit, then you're going to be chopped off the vine and, and burned. Strong words. Now, a branch connected to the vine receives nutrients from the vine very life itself. It is entirely dependent on the vine for its well-being, its fruitfulness. Our surrender to God is like a choice to seek nutrients from nowhere else, to seek life from no other source. 
Lack of complete surrender implies that we seek nutrients, that we seek life elsewhere. When we put those in term, when we when we put it in those terms, this is not merely a question that people currently living independently of Jesus must address. Every Christian, you and I, needs to choose to remain in Jesus. Each of us must decide to abide in him. Otherwise, the danger, as outlined very graphically by Jesus, is a withering and fiery consumption. Of course, as we remain in him, we bear much fruit. That involves both character fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, as well as great commission fruit, as we replicate ourselves in disciples who then make more disciples. Right? There's two kinds of fruit in that case, right? The Bible doesn't say there's two kinds of fruit, but he's using that same metaphor. The fruit of the Spirit the fruit of the Great Commission, making more disciples. As a Christian, we have to make a choice for where we get our nutrients. That's what this whole metaphor is implying. Are we relying fully on Jesus, spending time with him, spending time in his words, spending time in prayer, spending time with other Christians? Or are we choosing to look for nutrients somewhere else and that we're filling our lives with garbage, with rotten fruit? Where is our life sustainment coming from? So I, I hope that all makes sense. Like That's all I've got for today. It's a big challenge, and I want you to take that challenge on to look at where is your nutrients coming from? How is your fruit growing? And if your fruit isn't growing, take a look at your connection to the vine. Where are you getting your nutrients from? If you're all in with Jesus and you're spending time with him, with others, in prayer, in scripture, that is going to grow fruit, and it's going to keep growing as you keep going, as you keep doing. But if you're connecting yourself to something else, right, you're getting life from other things. I, I, there's a whole slew of other things that you could be getting life from then you're not actually choosing to abide in Jesus. You're abiding in something else and just doing the actions of what a Christian does. right? So take time this week to do a self-examination. Are you a superhero or are you a supervillain? Which super suit are you wearing? right? And like we said, the, suit, the colors and the suits and all that, that doesn't matter. It's all about the fruit. What fruit are you growing? Are you growing good fruit? Are you growing rotten fruit? Are you growing garbage? right? If you're not sure, I challenge you again. Ask a parent or a guardian, right? What do they think? They might be able to help you see ways that you act and the words that you use that you may not even know that you do or that you say, right? And they can give you encouragement for how you are living a spiritually connected life, that you are abiding in Jesus, and they'll and encourage you to keep doing those things. So I hope that you'll spend time this week in, in the Word, in the Bible, right? Do us some spiritual workouts. Do some new, fresh ways to do spiritual workouts. If you can't remember them, Go back to the start of this video and rewatch the very beginning. I'll go through them all again for you, just like I did the first time. That's how videos work. <laughs> right? So, and, and then also, like, spend time in Scripture, obviously. Spend time in prayer. Talk to God about it. Right? Like, it, you'll find answers in Scripture, but you also, like, you can talk to Him anytime, any day, all the time. In fact, like, let me pray for you now. Pray for us. Right? So just take a second. I know this may feel weird because we're not in the same room. Like, I've been in that boat before, too. When someone prays on TV, you're like, well, I can just look at the wall because I'm not there. Take one second. Be humble with me. I know this is hard. And future miles, you have to do this, too. <laughs> I see you, right? Just take some time. Close your eyes. Think about God for a second. Let me pray for you, okay? Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the students who are tuning in, the families who are there watching. Thank you for this metaphor of staying attached to the true vine, to you, and that when we do that, we're going to produce super fruits in our life, spiritual fruits. God, I ask that you help us all see what fruits are growing, and if they aren't, that you help us see where we've aligned ourselves with somebody else. Help us, God, to abide in you, to stay with you on the vine, so that we can grow super fruits and help other people know that we're followers of you and that we love them. Thank you again for today. Same we pray. Amen. All right, with that, I'll let you go. You guys are fantastic. I miss your faces. I'll see you soon. Hasta la pizza.